wa min Bismillahirrahmanirrahim We initiate today's program with the Qiraat, the recitation from the Holy Quran by Brother Ashraf Muhammadi. A'uzu billahi minash shaytanir rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayy al-qayyum la ta'khuzuhu sinatun wa la nawm lahu ma fi as-samawati wa ma fi al-ard man dhalladhi yashfa'u 119. إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤوذه حفظهما وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَزِيمُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَى كَلِمَةٍ سَبَائٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَتَّخِذَ بَعْدُنَا بَعْدًا أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ فَإِنْ تَوَلَّوْا فَقُولُوا اشْهَدُوا بِأَنَّ مُسْلِمُونَ the translation from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 255. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Allah, there is no God but He. The living, the self-subsisting, eternal no slumber can seize him nor sleep his are all the things in the heavens and on earth who is there can intercede in his presence except as he permits he knows what appears to his creatures as before or after or behind him nor shall they come past out of his knowledge except as he wills his throne does extend over the heavens and the earth, and he feels no fatigue in the guarding and preserving them, for he is the Most High, the Supreme in glory. In the name of Allah, Most Gracious, Most Merciful. Say, O people of the book, come to common terms as between us and you, that we worship none but Allah, that we associate no partners with him, that we erect not from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. 
If then they turn back, say, bear witness that we at least are Muslims bowing to the will of Allah. Verily, Allah has spoken the truth. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, welcome all of you to today's program. As did I, you may too have read two days back in the sacred space of the Times of India, Mumbai, the following verses. And I quote, Hold fast all together to God's rope and be not divided among yourselves. Remember with gratitude God's favor on you, for you were enemies, and he joined your hearts in love, so that by his grace you became brethren. Let there arise out of you one community, inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right, and forbidding what is wrong. Holy Quran, Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verses 103 and 104. This quotation aptly represents the Islamic Research Foundation's striving for Islamic Dawa, the proper presentation, understanding, and clarification of the message of Islam amongst Muslim and non-Muslims, as well as removing misconceptions about Islam amongst Muslims and non-Muslims. Reason, logic, and modern scientific understanding are the basis of all our presentations. Dr. Zakir Naik, Though a medical doctor by professional training has devoted himself for analyzing Islam and other religions objectively to understand and spread the real truth, understanding and clarifications about religion as a way of life. He's an international orator on Islam and comparative religion. In fact, in the last one year itself, in addition to his many talks in India, Dr. Zakir has delivered more than 160 public talks abroad in the United States of America, Canada, the United Kingdom, South Africa, Singapore, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, and Bahrain. He's acclaimed widely for his logical, reasonable, and scientific approach towards his subject. He's appreciated for his comparative knowledge of Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam especially for his verbatim quotations from religious scriptures. Concept of God in major religions. Why have we chosen this topic? We not only need to understand and realize what God is and what are his qualities, but also, and it is very important, we need to know what God certainly is not. Brothers and sisters, to promote better understanding and integration on similarities between religions, as well as living in real harmony along with the differences, the Islamic Research Foundation presents today's talk on Concept of God in Major Religions by Dr. Zakir Naik. Auz billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Rabbish rohali sadri. Respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Almighty God be on all of you. The non Muslim may be wondering that what was I murmuring or uttering in the beginning of my talk? I was not trying to mesmerize you or hypnotize you, but I was reciting a few verses of the Holy Quran from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25 and 28. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, asks Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, to deliver the message to the Pharaoh, Moses, peace be upon him, he prays to Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and recite these verses. Rabbish rahali sadri. O my Lord, expand my breast for me. Expand my center for me. Waya sirli amri. And make my task easy for me. Wahlul ugdata millesani. And remove 
the impediment from my speech. Since we know that Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, was a stammerer, was a stutterer. So he prays to Almighty God to remove the stammering, to loosen his tongue, as well as remove the barrier, if there is any, between him and the person to whom he is going to deliver the message. If a person is giving a talk on other religions, those people in the audience who do not belong to that religion, they may think that this person is going to speak against their religion. For example, if suppose a Hindu is giving a talk on other religions, the non-Hindus may feel that he is going to speak against my religion. If a Christian is giving a talk on other religions, the non-Christians may feel that he is going to speak against my religion. Similarly, I being a Muslim, when I am giving a talk on other religions, the non-Muslims may feel that I am going to speak against their religion. That is the reason. I am praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, to loosen my tongue as well as remove the impediment, the barrier, mental or otherwise, if there is any between me and you. The topic of this morning's talk is concept of God in major religions. Religion, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods that deserve obedience and worship. The Qari, Pradash of Muhammadi, he recited two verses of the Holy Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 64, which says, Kulia Hilal Kitab. Say to the people of the book, Ta'ala ila kalmitin sawa'im bainana bainakum that come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate to partners with him. Wala yattakhiza baaduna baadan arbaban mindun illah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fakul ushadu. Say we bear witness, we are now Muslimun, that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a verse of the Holy Quran, which shows you a way how to speak with people of different communities. It says, Ta'ala ila kalmitin sawa'im, bainana bainakum, that come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'uda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. That we associate to partners with Him. One thing common in all the major religions of the world is that the God they worship, they believe He is the same God for them as well as for the others. For example, the God which the Hindus worship. They believe he is the same God for the Hindus as well as for the non-Hindus. The God which the Christians worship. They believe he is the same God for the Christians as well as for the non-Christians. Similarly, the God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we Muslims worship, we believe he is the same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the Muslims as well as for the non-Muslims. The major religions of the world can be broadly classified as Semitic religions and non-Semitic religions. The non-Semitic religions are further divided into Aryan and non-Aryan religions. The Semitic religions are those religions that are followed by the Semites. Who are the Semites? The Semites are the descendant of Shem, who was the son of Prophet Noah, peace be upon him, which is mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, chapter number 5 to chapter number 11. So Semitic religions are those religions that are followed by the Jews, by the Arabs, by the Assyrians, by the Phoenicians, who speak Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, 
Akkadian, Phoenicians, etc. The major amongst the Semitic religions are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of which are prophetic religions. The non-Semitic religions are further divided into Aryan and non-Aryan religions. The Aryan religions are the religions followed by the Aryans, a group of Indo-European speaking community which spread in Iran and northern India in the first half of the second millennium BC, that's 2000 to 1500 BC. The Aryan religion is further divided into Vedic and non-Vedic religions. The Vedic religion is Brahmanism, which has been given the misnomer of Hinduism. The non-Vedic religion are Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism, etc. Amongst the non-Aryan religions, we have those of the Chinese origin, like Taoism, Confucianism, etc. Those of the Japanese origin, like Shintoism, etc. But most of these religions, they do not have a concept of God. Therefore, they are preferably called as ethical systems instead of religions. As far as my talk today will be concerned, I will be speaking about the concept of God in major religions of Semitic and Aryan origin. To understand the concept of God, the best and the most accurate way is to analyze their religious scriptures and understand what it has to speak about God. Trying to analyze the concept of God by looking at the followers is not always correct because most of the followers, they themselves do not know what the scripture speaks about God. So let's analyze today the concept of God in major religions by analyzing their religious scriptures. First, we'll discuss the Aryan religions. Hinduism is the most popular of all the Aryan religions. And if you ask a common Hindu that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say 33, some may say a thousand, while the others may say 33 crores, 330 million. But if you ask a Hindu learned man who knows his religious scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindu should actually believe only in one God. The major difference between the common Hindu and the Muslim is that the common Hindu believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. That is, everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the snake is God, the monkey is God, the human beings are God. The Muslim believes that everything is God's, G-O-D with the apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the snake belongs to God, the monkey belongs to God, the human beings belong to God. So the major difference between the common Hindu and the Muslim is the apostrophe S. The Hindus say everything is God, and we Muslims say everything is God's, G-O-D with apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do we do it? As the Quran says, That come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na wuda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. That we associate to partners with Him. So let's analyze the concept of God in Hinduism by analyzing their religious scriptures. The most popular amongst all the Hindu religious scriptures is the Bhagavad Gita. This is a copy of Bhagavad Gita in the IRF. We have, alhamdulillah, more than 30 different 
translation is only of Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita says in chapter number 7, verse number 20, that those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship the demigods. That means the materialistic people, they worship demigods. That means not the true almighty God. The Upanishads are the other sacred scripture of the Hindus. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ekam evadityam. God is one only, not a second. That means there's only one God. He doesn't have any partners. He is alone. Same as the Holy Quran, which is mentioned in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1. Kul huallahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. It's mentioned in the Sveta Swatara Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. Na kasya kasji. Janita Nakadipa, which means of him has no parents nor Lord. He has got no parents. He has got no masters. That means he alone is sufficient. He is not dependent on anyone else. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 3. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. The quotation I gave from Upanishad was translated by S. Radha Krishnan. And we have other translations also in our foundation. Further, if you read in the Sveta Svatara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, it says, Na tasya pratima asti. There is no likeness of him. Same as the Holy Quran, Surah Class, chapter number 112, verse number 4. Walam yakullahu kufu an ahad. There is nothing like him. It's further mentioned the next verse of the Sveta Svatara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 20, that his form cannot be seen. No one can see him with the eyes. Similar to the message which is given in the Holy Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 103, no vision can grasp him, but he graspeth all vision. He is beyond comprehension, yet he is acquainted with all things. Amongst all the religious scriptures of the Hindus, the most sacred are the Vedas. And there are principally four Vedas. The Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved, and the Atharva Ved. The Rig Ved deals with songs of praises. The Ajur Ved deals with sacrificial formulas. The Sam Ved with melody, and the Atharva Ved with magical formulas. It's mentioned in the Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, Verse number three. Na tasya patima asti. There is no image of him. And the verse continues and says that he is unborn and he should be worshipped. It mentions in the Chapter number 40. Verse number eight. That God is bodiless and pure. It's mentioned in the Ayurved. Chapter number 40. Verse number nine. Andhatma pravishanti ya sambhuti apaste. Which means they are entering darkness, those who worship the asambhuti. The asambhuti are the natural thing, like air, water, fire. And the verse continues. They are sinking more in darkness, those who worship the sambhuti. The sambhuti are the created things. The quotation I gave of Yajurved was by Devi Chand. as well as by Ralph T. Griffith. The other Veda is the Atharva Veda. It's mentioned in Atharva Veda, book number 20, chapter number 58, verse number 3, it says, Dev Maha Osi, God is verily great, same as Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. Amongst all the Vedas, the most sacred, and the oldest is the Rig Veda. It's mentioned in Rig Veda, book number one, hymn number 164, verse number 46. Sages call one God by many names. 
That means there are various names given to this one God. And the Rig Veda alone gives no less than 33 different attributes to Almighty God. Most of which are mentioned in Rig Veda, book number 2, hymn number 1. And one of the beautiful attributes which is mentioned in Rig Veda of Almighty God is Brahma, which is mentioned in Rig Veda, book number 2, hymn number 1, verse number 3. Brahma means the creator. If you translate into Arabic, it means Khalik. We Muslims have got no objection if anyone calls Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Khalik or creator or Brahma. But if someone says that Brahma is Almighty God who has got four heads and on each head is a crown and he has got four arms, we Muslims take strong objection to it. Moreover, it is even prohibited in Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Na tasya asti, there is no image of him. Another beautiful attribute which is given in the Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, verse number 3, is Vishnu. Vishnu means the sustainer. If you translate into Arabic, it means Rob. We Muslims have got no objection if someone calls Almighty God as Rob or Cherisher, Sustainer or Vishnu. But if someone says that Vishnu is Almighty God who has got four hands and one of his right hands holds the chakra, that is the discus, and one of his left hands holds the conch and he's riding on a bird or reclining on a couch of snake, we Muslims take strong objection to it. We are going against the Ajurved. Chapter number 40, verse number 8, which says, God is bodiless, as well as Upanishad. Chapter number 4, verse number 19, of Sweta Swatara Upanishad, which says, Na tasya patima asti. There is no likeness of him. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 1, verse number 1. That means, do not worship anyone besides him alone. Praise him alone. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 5, chapter number 81, verse number 1. It says, Verily, great is the glory of the divine creator. Same as Surah Fatiha, chapter number 1, verse number 2. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds. It further mentioned in Rig Ved. Book number 3, hymn number 34, verse number 1. It says that he is the bounteous giver. It further mentioned in the Ayur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 16. It says, that lead us to the good path and save us from the sin which makes us wander and go astray. Similar to the verse of the Holy Quran of Surah Fatiha, chapter number 1, verse number 6 and 7, which says, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, sirat al-lazina namta alayhim, ghair al-maghdubi alayhim waladwaleen. That shows the straight path, the path of those who have earned thine favor and the path of those who go not astray. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 6, hymn number 45, verse number 16. Ya ik it mushtihi. Praise him who's matchless and alone. The quotation I gave from the Rig Ved was by Satya Prakash Narayan and Satya Kam Vidya Lankar. As well as by Rolf T. Griffith, Volume 1 and Volume 2. We have various translations of religious scriptures of various religions. So whatever quotation we give, if anyone wants to verify that the speaker is pulling a fast one, they are most welcome to come to a foundation and take a photostat copy. And all these translations which I gave to you is not done by Muslims. It's done by 
the people who follow that religion as well as by Orientalists. The Brahma Sutra of Hinduism, of the Vedanta, the main creed is Ekam Braham Dustya Naste, Niya Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you will understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Let's discuss the concept of God in Sikhism. Sikhism is a non-Semitic Aryan, non-Vedic religion. Though it has a small following as compared to the other major religions, it is an offshoot of Hinduism. Sikhism was founded by Guru Nanak Sahib at the end of the 15th century. And it originated from the area of Pakistan and Northwest India, that's Punjab, the land of the five rivers. And this religion, which was founded by Guru Nanak Sahib, it's religion of 10 Gurus. The first one who founded the religion is Guru Nanak Sahib. And the last and the tenth one is Guru Gobinda Sahib. Guru Nanak Sahib was born in a Kshatriya, warrior caste family. But he was very much influenced by the Muslims. Sikh is derived from the word Sisya, which means a disciple or follower. And the sacred book of the Sikhs is Shri Guru Granth Sahib. This is the book, Shri Guru Granth Sahib. And the Sikh has to maintain his five Ks. The first K is the Kesh, the uncut hair, which all the Gurus kept. The second is the Kanga, the comb, which is used to keep the hair clean. The third is the Kala, the metal or the steel bangle used for strength and for self-restraint. The fourth is the Kripan, the dagger, which is used for self-defense. And the fifth is the Kacha, the long underweight, knee length, or underdraws, which is used for agility. These 5K also help in identifying any Sikh. The best definition that any Sikh can give regarding the concept of Almighty God and Sikhism is quote the Mool Mantra, the fundamental creed of Sikhism, which occurs in the beginning of Sri Guru Granth Sahib. At the beginning, that is, of Sri Guru Granth Sahib, volume number one, chapter number one, verse number one, it's also called as Japuji, Mool Mantra. It says that only one God exists. And he's called by the true, the creator, the one free from fear and hatred, the immortal, not begotten, self-existent, great and compassionate. Sikhism strictly believes in monotheism. And Almighty God, in the unmanifest form, is called as Ek Omkara. And in the manifest form, He's called as Omkara. And Guru Granth Sahib, he gave various attributes to this manifest form of Almighty God, Omkara, and called it also as Kartar, the creator, Akal, the eternal, Satanama, the holy one, Sahib, the Lord, Parvardigar, the cherisher, Rahim, the merciful, Karim, the benevolent, and he also called him as Wahe Guru, one true Lord, one true God. Sikhism, besides believing in monotheism, it is also against Autarvada, the concept of incarnation of God. They are against that God can take human forms, 
can incarnate. And they're also against idol worship. Guru Nanak was very much influenced by Sant Kabir. No wonder if you read the Guru Granth Sahib. Several chapters contain many couplets, dohas of Sant Kabir. And one of the famous dohas of Sant Kabir is Dukh mein sumra na sab karay, sukh mein karay na koya. Jo sukh mein sumra na karay, to dukh kaay hoi. Everyone remembers God during trouble. No one remembers him during peace and happiness. The one who remembers him during peace and happiness, why will he have trouble? A similar message given the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 8. That man, when trouble touches him, he cries out to the Lord and repents to him. And when the Lord bestows him from his mercy, the man forgets that he had prayed and cried and he associates rivals to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's discuss the concept of God in Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is a non-Semitic Aryan, non-Vedic religion, which is not associated with Hinduism and it's a prophetic religion. Zoroastrianism is also called as Parsism and it was founded by Prophet Zoroaster. It's an ancient religion of Persia, about two and a half thousand years old. And the sacred scriptures are the Dasatir and Avesta. The Dasatir can be further divided into Khurda Dasatir or Kalan Dasatir. And the Avesta can be further divided into Kurda Avesta or Kalan Avesta, the Maha Avesta or the Zend Avesta. This is a copy of the Avesta, one of the volumes of Avesta. And there are various other translations of the Avesta present in the Islamic Research Foundation. The Zoroastrians, the Parsis, they call Almighty God as Ahura Mazda. Ahura means the Lord, God. Mazda means wise. Ahura Mazda means the wise Lord or the wise God. And he has been given several attributes and names in the Dasatir. For example, he is the only one. He has no beginning, no origin and no end. He has no father, no mother. No wife, no son. He has got no image. He is beyond imagination. There's nothing like him. No vision can see him. He is beyond comprehension. He is closer to you than yourself. There are also other attributes given to Almighty God in the Avesta. The other sacred scripture of the Parsis, it's mentioned in the Avesta, in the Gathas and the Yasnas. He's called as the creator in Yasna, chapter number 31, verse number 7 and 11. And also in other places, in Yasna, chapter number 44, verse number 7, chapter number 50, verse number 11, chapter number 51, verse number 7. In several places, he's called as the creator. He's also referred as the mightiest the greatest in Yasna, chapter number 33, verse number 11, as well as in chapter number 45, verse number 6. He is referred to as the beneficent in the Yasna, in chapter number 33, verse number 11, as well as in Yasna, chapter number 48, verse number 3. He is referred to as the bounteous, no less than seven times only in Yasna, chapter number 43, verse number 4, 5. 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15. He's also referred as the bounteous in other places of Yasna, chapter number 44, verse number 2, chapter number 45, verse number 5, chapter number 46, verse number 9, as well as chapter number 48, verse number 3. He's referred to as bounteous several times. So if you read the scriptures of the Parsis, you'll understand the correct concept of Almighty God in Parsism, in Zoroastrianism. 
Now let's discuss the Semitic religions. Major Semitic religions are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. First, we'll discuss about the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. Moses, peace be upon him, says, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4, Shama Israelo adna ila haino adna ikhad. It's a Hebrew quotation, which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. That means God is one and only. It's further mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I, even I, am Lord. And besides me, there's no Savior. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, verse number 5. I am Lord, and there's none else. And I'm God besides me who there is no one. In the book of Isaiah, Chapter number 46, verse number 9, it says, I am Lord, and there is none else. I am God, and there is nothing like me. It's further mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. It said that God Almighty says in the scriptures, Thou shalt have no other gods besides me. Thou shalt make unto thee no graven image of any likeness, of anything that is in the heavens above, that is in the earth beneath, and that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, the God, is a jealous God. The same message is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9, that thou shalt have no other gods besides me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image of any likeness, of anything that is in the heavens above, that is in the earth beneath, and in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, the God, am a jealous God. So if you read the Old Testament, you will understand the concept of God in Judaism that believes only in one God and is totally against idol worship. Before we discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I would like to make a few points clear. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together hand in hand. But there are parting of ways. There are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was almighty God. He himself claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there's not a single unequivocal statement in the whole Bible where Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says, worship me. I would like to repeat that statement that there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus, peace be upon him, said, my father is greater than I. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. 
because I seek not my will, but the will of thy father who has sent me. He never claimed divinity. In fact, he came to testify the previous law. And he mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to verse number 20. Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till the heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. And whosoever, therefore, shall break one of the least commandments and teach men to do so, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep them and teach them so, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For verily, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus Christ peace be upon him said, that if you people want to enter heaven, you have to keep each and every commandment of prophet Moses, peace be upon him. You have to follow each and every law given in the Old Testament, including the verses I quoted earlier, that there is one God and you should not do idol worship. You should not make any graven image of him. Jesus, peace be upon him. He never said that he was God. In fact, he said that he was sent by God. He was the prophet of God. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John. Chapter number 14, verse number 24. The words that you hear are not mine, but it's my father's who has sent me. Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3. This is eternal life, so that you may know there is one true God and Jesus Christ who thou hast sent. And it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, that when one of the person approaches Jesus, peace be upon him, and says, Good master, what good things shall I do that I shall attain eternal life? Jesus, peace be upon him, replies in verse number 17 of Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19. And Jesus said unto him, Why thou callest me good? For there is none good except one that is God. And if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Jesus, peace be upon him, never said that if you want to go to heaven, you consider me as almighty God. He never said that you believe that I will die for your sin. In fact, he said, you keep the commandments. It's further mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. O men of Israel, hear this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God amongst you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in your presence and you are witness. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God by miracles and wonders which God did by him. And when Jesus, peace be upon him, was asked, that which is the first of the commandments. He repeated verbatim what was said earlier by Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. He said, Shama Israelo, Adana Elahaino Adnai Khad. It's a Hebrew quotation which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. So if you read the Bible, you will understand the concept of God in Christianity. It reminds me of an incident where Maulana Rahmatullah Karanvi, he was having a discussion with a Christian missionary who was trying to prove to Maulana Sahib that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God Almighty and that Jesus, peace be upon him, died for the sins of human beings. After a great deal of time, without any results, the discussion was continuing. Later on, the servant of Maulana Sahib, he comes and whispers something in Maulana's ears. The Maulana's face becomes sad. He starts crying. The Christian missionary asks, Maulana Sahib, 
what's the bad news? The Maulana Sahib said in a very sad tone, my servant, he just gave me information. He brought news that Archangel Gabriel, he died. The Christian missionary began to laugh loudly. Maulana Sahib, you being such an intelligent person, how can you believe in such absurd things? Can angels die? The Maulana Sahib said, when God can die, why can't angels die? <laughs> and the Christian missionary, without speaking a single word, he left. It's a battle of wits. Let's discuss the concept of Almighty God in Islam. The best answer that anyone can give you regarding the concept of Almighty God in Islam is quote to you the Surah of the Holy Quran, Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Say He is Allah one and only. Allah Hu Samad. Allah the Absolute and Eternal. As Samad is a bit difficult to translate. It means that He exists and He has created things when nothing existed. Everything and every person is dependent on Him. But He is not dependent on any person or anything. As Samad, the Absolute and Eternal. Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the touchstone of theology. Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. Theo in Greek means God. Logi means study. Theology means study of God. Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. If anyone wants to purchase or sell any of the gold jewelries, first they'll evaluate their gold jewelry. And for that, they will go to a goldsmith. And the goldsmith, he takes your gold jewelry and he rubs it against a touchstone. And he compares the color with samples of gold which he has rubbed at the side. And then tells you whether it's 24 karat gold, whether it's 22 karat gold, or whether it is not gold at all. It may be fake gold, because all that glitters is not gold. Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. It's a four-line definition. If you apply to any candidate who says that is Almighty God, and if he fits in this definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as Almighty God. It's a touchstone. It's the asset test to decipher whether the person that anyone claims, whether he is Almighty God or not. It's the asset test. It's the touchstone. Four line definition. Qul hu Allah hu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Wa lam yakullahu kufu an ahad. There is nothing like him. It's a four-line definition. Anyone claiming to be Almighty God, if that candidate fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as Almighty God. For example, some people say that Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho Rajnish, he's Almighty God. I would like to make it very clear, I said some people say Bhagwan Rajnish is God. Not Hindus say Bhagawan Rajnish is God. Because once, during question answer time, there was a Hindu gentleman who came and told me that we Hindus don't believe in Bhagawan Rajnish as God. I have read the Hindu scripture. I know that the Hindu scriptures don't call Bhagawan Rajnish as God. I said some people call him God and Rajnish has got followers from various different religions. Let's put him to test of the touchstone of theology, Surah class. The first is, Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Is Rajnish one and only? We know that we have several such fake godmen, especially in our country, India. He is not one and only. But there may be some people who are disciples of Rajnish and say, no, no, Rajnish is one and only. 
ओके लेट्स गुड द सेकंड टेस्ट अल्लाह हो समद अल्लाह द एब्सोल्यूट एंड इटर्नल इज रजनीश एब्सोल्यूट एंड इटर्नल वी नो फ्रॉम हिज बायोग्राफी दैट ही वाज सफरिंग फ्रॉम डायबिटीज फ्रॉम अस्थमा फ्रॉम क्रॉनिक बैक एक एंड ही अलेज दैट द अमेरिकन गवर्नमेंट दे गिव हिम स्लो पॉइजनिंग इमेजिन गॉड बीइंग पॉइजन The third test is, lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. We know that Rajnish had parents. He had a mother and father. He was born in Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh in India. But he was a very intelligent person. Later on, his parents became his own disciples. And in the year 1981, Rajnish he goes to America, and in oregon he establishes his own town and calls it rajnishpuram he took america for a ride later on the american government they arrested him and put him in jail and later on kicked him out of the country in 1985 when he was kicked out from america he comes back to india and in pune he starts rajnish neo sanyas commune which later on he called it as osho commune and when you go to pune in the osho commune it's mentioned on his tombstone osho never born never died but visited the earth from the 11th of december 1931 to the 19th of january 1990 they forgot to mention that he was not given visas to 21 different countries imagine almighty god visiting the earth and he requires visas <laughs> and the archbishop of greece said that if you don't deport rajnish we will burn his house and the house of his disciple and the last test walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad it is so stringent it's impossible for anyone besides allah subhanahu wa taala the true almighty god to pass it says there's nothing like him the moment you can imagine the moment you can draw a mental picture what god is he is not god we know that rajnish he was a human being like you and me he had one head two hands two legs two eyes one nose one mouth long flowing beard long hair so surely he can't be almighty god walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad there is nothing like him and this test walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad is so stringent that no one besides allah subhanahu wa taala can pass suppose someone says that anil swashnigar you know anil swashnigar the person who is known as the strongest man in the world he was given the title mr universe is suppose someone says that almighty god he is a thousand times as strong as anil swashnigar the moment you can compare god to anyone whether it be anil swashnigar whether it be dara singh or king kong whether it be a thousand times or a million times the moment you can compare almighty god to anyone he is not almighty god walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad there is nothing like him this is a four line definition given in the holy quran surah ikhlas which is the touchstone of theology we muslims we prefer calling allah subhanahu wa taala by the arabic name allah instead of the english word god because the arabic word allah it is pure it is unique whereas the english word god it can be played around with you can play around with that word if you add a s to god it becomes gods plural of god there is nothing like plural allah in islam qul huwa allah ahad say he is allah one and only if you add a d e s s to god it becomes goddess a female god there is nothing like male allah or female allah in islam allah is unique he has got no gender if you add a father to god it becomes godfather he is my godfather he is my guardian there is nothing like allah father in islam or allah abba in islam if you add a mother to god it becomes godmother 
There's nothing like Allah mother or Allah Amin Islam. Allah is a unique word. It's a pure word. If you prefix a tin before God, it becomes tin God. There's nothing like tin Allah and Islam. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But if some Muslims, if they use this word while speaking to non-Muslims, I have got no objection. Because non-Muslims may not know what is the concept of Allah. So if anyone uses God for Allah, I have got no objection. But the more appropriate word is Allah. Otherwise, the Holy Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, Qulidullah awidur Rahman, ayyakma tad'u, falawul asma wal husna. Say call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, it is well. To him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And there are no less then 99 different attributes given of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran. No less than 99 different attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are given in the Holy Quran. For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Kareem, most gracious, most merciful, most benevolent. He's called as Rabb, as Razik, as Lord, Cherisher, Sustainer, Provider. No less than 99 different attributes are given in the Holy Quran for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same message is repeated. Besides Surah Isra chapter 17 verse number 110, it is also mentioned in Surah Taha chapter number 20 verse number 8. In Surah Araf chapter number 7 verse number 180, as well as in Surah Al-Hashar chapter 59 verse number 24, which says, to Allah belongs the most beautiful names. But whatever attribute you give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God, it should be a unique attribute. It should only refer to Him and to no one else. And if we reverse the order, it should yet point out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, I am 5 feet 11 inches tall. I wear spectacles. I live in Bombay. If someone says that Dr. Zakir Naik, is 5 feet 11 inches tall. It's a correct characteristic. But if we reverse it, who is 5 feet 11 inches tall? You will find more than a thousand people who are 5 feet 11 inches tall. It doesn't point specifically to me. It's not unique. If you say Dr. Zakir Naik wears spectacles, it's correct. But it's not unique. Because if you reverse it, who wears spectacles? There will be more than a thousand people who wear spectacles. If someone says, Dr. Zakir Naik lives in Bombay, he's right, but it's not unique. Who lives in Bombay? More than a million people live in Bombay. So the attribute that you give should be unique. For example, if someone says that Dr. Zakir Naik is the father of Farik Zakir Naik, who was born on the 10th of July, 1994, in Jangir Nursing Home, in Pune, that's a unique attribute. Because if we reverse it, who is the father of Farik Zakir Naik, born on the 10th of July, 1994, in Jangir Nursing Home, in Pune, the answer is only one, Dr. Zakir Naik, no one else. It's a unique attribute. It points out to no one, but one person. Similarly, let me give you another example. That Dr. Zakir Naik is the founder chairman of IRF Educational Trust, which was established on the 6th of November, 1992, in Dongri, Mumbai. If we reverse it, who is the founder chairman of IRF Educational Trust, which was established on the 6th of November, 1992, in Dongri, Mumbai? The answer is only one, Dr. Zakir Naik. Similarly, if you call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any attribute, by any name, it should be unique. You can't say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of a building. Because even many builders can build building. You can call him the creator of the universe. Khalik, the creator. Who's the creator? Only one. 
Who's the ultimate creator of the universe? Only one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman. Who's the most gracious? The answer is only one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahim. Who's the most merciful? The answer is only one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it should be a unique attribute. The example I gave of myself was unique, but nothing great. Being the founder chairman of IRF Education Trust is nothing great. It's unique, fine. It's nothing great. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, besides the attribute being unique, it is something ultimate. Being the father of Farek Zakir Naik is not ultimate. It's unique. It's not ultimate. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attribute, besides being unique, should be ultimate. You cannot give attributes which are just common, which you and I can also do. Secondly, besides giving unique attributes, it should not be combined with characteristics which do not belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if someone says that Dr. Zakir Naik is the father of Farik Zakir Naik, who was born on the 10th of July, 1994, Zangin nursing home in Pune, and is four feet tall. The attribute is correct. I am the father of the person who he said, but I'm not four feet tall. I'm five feet 11 inches tall. If someone says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, almighty God is a creator, but he has got a human form like you and me, one head, two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two hands. The creator attribute is correct, but the characteristic of a human form is wrong. So besides the attribute being unique, it should not be mixed up with false attributes. And the third is that the various attributes that you give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should point only to one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not more than that. Because there's only one, call hu Allah hu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. So if someone says, the Dr. Zakir Naik is the father of Farik Zakir Naik, born on the 10th of July, 1994, in Jangir Singh, Pune, and Abdullah Sheikh, is the founder chairman of IRF Irrigation Trust, which was established on 6th of November 1992 in Dongri, Mumbai. One attribute is correct of mine, but my attribute is given to another person who's not me. Abdullah Sheikh and Dr. Zakir Naik aren't the same. So you cannot say that Khalik, the creator, is one God, and Ar Rahim, the merciful, is another God. If someone says, the rain god is different, cloud god is different, and sun god is different, and creator is different, and cherisher is different. It's totally wrong. The attributes are correct, but it should point out only to one person and no one else. People may ask me that what is wrong in having more than one god? The polytheists they may say, Dr. Zakir Naik, what is the harm in having many gods? If we have many gods, there will be fighting between them. And each one will try to defeat the other and try and establish his rule. So people may say, see, we can divide. One is a god of rain, one is a god of sun, one is a god who created, one is a god who is a cherisher. If we divide such way and have multiple gods, that means one god is unable to do the things of the other god. He does not have knowledge of the other god. It means it's a deficient god. It's not an ultimate God, and we don't want to believe in a deficient God. We want to believe in a God which is ultimate, the supreme. No wonder you find in the mythology of certain religions, God fighting among themselves. And one God killing the other God, and one God takes the help of the other God to defeat the third God. This is found in the mythology. The Holy Quran gives the answer in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 22. That it says that if there were more gods besides Allah, there would surely be confusion. And we know that there is no confusion in the universe. The universe is running harmoniously. It further mentioned in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 91, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have any sons, neither does he have any partners. If there were many gods besides Allah, each god would have taken what they created and would have hoarded over the other. So surely, there has to be only one true god. If you analyze all the religions which speak about concept of god, all of them ultimately believe in monotheism. That is, they believe in one god. 
any religion which believes in a concept of God, ultimately that religion believes only in one God at a higher level. At the lower level, there may be other gods, but at the higher level, it finally believes in one God only. If you analyze the scriptures of Almighty God, they spoke about the true concept of Almighty God. But later on, the scriptures, they got manipulated. They got interpolated. They got corrupted. Why? By people for their own requirements, to fulfill their own material desires. And later on, you have a religion which has been changed from monotheism to polytheism or pantheism. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 79, Woe to those who write the book with their own hands. Go to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this is from Allah. To traffic with it for a miserable price. Go to those for what their hands do write and go to those for what they earn. So the Holy Quran says that people have changed the scripture of Almighty God for their own material desires. Woe to such people and woe to what they earn. There are certain religions like Buddhism, Confucianism, you have Taoism, which do not comment on God. Neither do they confirm nor deny the existence of Almighty God. It's called as an agnostic religion. We have other religions like Jainism, which are atheistic. They deny the existence of Almighty God. Regarding how to prove to the atheist or the agnostic the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can refer to my video cassette, Is the Quran God's Word, part one and two. This talk was given about two years ago in the same auditorium two years ago, in the same auditorium, Billa Matushri, where I've proved here to an atheist, to an agnostic, to a Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Jain, whether he be a scientist, to all these people with reason, logic and science on the basis of the Holy Quran, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all those who want to know how to prove to an atheist or an agnostic the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can refer to my video cassette, part one and part two. In Islam, we believe in Tawheed. Tawheed does not merely mean monotheism or merely meaning believing in one God. It has much more to it. Tawheed means unification, asserting oneness, and is derived from the Arabic verb wahda which means to unite, to unify, to consolidate. And there are three categories in Tawheed. The first is Tawheed or Rububiyah. It's derived from the verb Rub, which means Lord, Cherisher, Sustainer. It means maintaining the unity of Lordship. And the basic concept here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who created all the things which exist. He is not dependent on anything or any person. But all things and persons are dependent on him. He is absolute. Whereas all the other things, they are relative and they are temporarily and they are conditional. The second category is Tawheed Al Asma was Sifat, which means maintaining the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. And there are basically five points in this category. The first is Allah should be referred to according to what Allah and His Messenger described Him. Second is Allah should be referred to as He has referred to Himself. 
no one can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al ghadib the angry one. So the Quran says that he gets angry, but that's a quality which you cannot say the angry one because Allah and his messenger didn't give that attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third is you cannot give human qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like some scripture says that God Almighty, after creating the universe, he rested. He was tired. Some scriptures say that he repented. See, repenting, getting tired are acts which human beings require. Not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the criteria for this category is from Surah Ashura, chapter 42, verse number 11, which says, Laisa ka mislihi shayya. That there is nothing whatever like him. There is nothing whatever like him. And the verse continues, he is the seer and hearer of all things. But this seeing and hearing cannot be compared with what we human beings see and hear. Because for us to hear, we require sound waves. We require a ear apparatus. God Almighty does not require all these things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees and hears in a different way as compared to what we human beings see and hear. The fourth point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attribute cannot be given to any of his creatures. Like you can't call a human being without a beginning and without an end. A person who will not die, he's eternal. You can't give this attribute to any human being or any of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last point is, you cannot give the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to any of his creatures without prefixing abd. Certain indefinite forms like rauf, rahim can be given. But the definite form ultimate without prefixing abd, you cannot give. Like Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahim. Abd means slave. Slave of Rahman, Ar Rahman. Slave of Ar Rahim. Abdullah, slave of Allah. Neither can you give this Abd to anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot say Abdul Rasul, the slave of the messenger. You cannot say Abdul Nabi, the slave of the Prophet. The third category of Tawheed is Tawheed al Ibadah. The Ibadah has been derived from the Arabic word Abd, which means slave, servant. Ibadah means to worship. But many people have the misconception that worship merely means offering prayers. A prayer is one of the high form of worship, but that's not the only form of worship. As I said, Ibadah is derived from Abd, meaning slave, servitude. So worship means any commandments you follow of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are doing worship. Anything which you do not do, what Allah has asked you not to do, that is Ibadah. So Ibadah is not merely prayers, it has much more to it. Obeying the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ibadah. Without following the third category of Tawheed al-Ibadah, which is maintaining the unity of worship, following the first two categories only is useless. Because the Holy Quran says that there were pagans, Arabs, at the time of the Prophet, who believed in the first two categories. That is, Tawheed al-Rububiya and Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. But not in the third category. And they were referred as mushriks and kafirs, idolaters, and rejectors of faith. The Holy Quran says in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 31, say, who is he that sustains life to you in the sky and the earth? Or who is it that hears and sees all things? And who is it that gives life to things that are dead and gives death to things which are life? Who is it that regulates and controls the affairs Soon they will say, it is Allah. So why don't you have piety towards him? Why don't you worship him? A similar message is given in Surah Zukhruf, chapter 43, verse number 87, that when you ask them, who has created them? They will say, Allah. But they are far deluded from the truth. So 
the pagan is Arab at the time of the Prophet. Even they had a concept of one supreme almighty God, which they called as Allah. But along with it, they even had about 360 idols which they worship. So, if you worship anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are not following the third category of Tawheed al-Ibadah. And, with the first, second or third category of Tawheed is missed by anyone. Or if there is any deficiency in fulfilling any point of any of the three categories, it is called as Shirk. Shirk means associating partners. It means sharing. And in Islamic terms, it means associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The biggest sin which is mentioned in the Holy Quran is shirk, associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not only mean that you worship some other god, but shirk that is not fulfilling any of the three categories of Tawheed leads to shirk. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive associating partners to him. If he pleases, he may forgive anything else. But the sin of associating partners with Allah, he shall never forgive. The same message is repeated in Surah Nisa. Chapter number 4, verse number 116. That those who do the sin of joining gods with Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive them. Anything else if he pleases, he may forgive. But all those who join gods with Allah, they have strayed far away from the truth. It's mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 72. لَقَدْ قَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَصِيُّ إِبْنُ مَرْيَمَ that they are doing kufr. Those who say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary, waqal al-Masih, but said Christ, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, A'budullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inna huma yishrik billah. Anyone who associate partners with Allah, faqad haram Allah alayhi wal jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for them. Wama wahun naar. And fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. The Holy Quran says that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Anyone who associates partners with Allah, Allah will make Jannat haram for him. And fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. When I start my talk, in the beginning of it, Takari, he recited verses of Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im bainana bainakum that come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term, Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. It doesn't say we believe in one and only Allah. Believing is not sufficient. It says, Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam, that we associate no partners with him. So only believing in one God is not sufficient. You should even only worship him and no one else and associate no partners with him. The Holy Quran says in Surah Anam chapter 6, verse number 108, Revile not ye those whom they worship besides Allah lest out of spite they revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their ignorance. The Holy Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 27, that if all the trees on the earth were made into pen, and the ocean into ink, and the seven ocean to back it up, yet the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be exhausted in writing, because he is all-powerful, full of wisdom. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Hajj, chapter 22, verse number 73, which says, E men, there's a parable set forth for you. Listen to it. Those whom you call upon, anyone besides Allah, 
they cannot even create a fly. They cannot even create a fly if all of them got together. And if the fly took away something from them, they cannot even release from it. Feeble are those who petition, feeble are those on whom they petition. Wa'akhru dawana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. To analyze the concept of God in major religions adequately for all present here today, in the limited time available, we would like the following rules to be followed during the question and answer session. Questions asked should be on the topic, concept of God in major religions only. Questions not relevant to the topic, including any general questions on religion, will not be allowed. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. We will allow one question on each of the mics in clockwise rotation. Written questions on slip papers, which are available from our volunteers on the sides and in the center aisle, would be given secondary preference after the questions on the mics are answered by Dr. Zakir and if time permits. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question. May we have the first question from the lady side, please. Assalamu alaikum. I am Sabah Bakai from Delhi. And my question to Zakir uncle is, the Christian concept of the God is a trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But these three are one. Does this mean that they believe in only one God? Sister asked the question that the Christians believe in Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that they are one. Does it mean that they also believe in one God? Sister, if you analyze the word Trinity, it occurs nowhere in the Bible. If you search the full Bible, the word Trinity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. It's not there in the Bible. But the word Trinity is there in the Holy Quran. But the word Trinity is there in the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 171, it says, Don't say Trinity. This has stop it, it's better for you. For God is one God. It's again repeated in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 73. It says, Lakat kafr lazina kalu inna laha. They blaspheme those who say that Allah is one of three in a trinity. For there is no God but Allah. So the word trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, but it is there in the Quran. And Quran says, Wala taqulu salasa. Don't say trinity. The closest verse that you can find in the Bible, which can be taken for Trinity is the first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, which says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. This verse of the Bible, first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse number 7, is the closest resemblance to Trinity in the full Bible. But if you read the Revised Standard Version, which has been revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different Christian cooperating denominations, they have removed this verse from the Bible as an interpolation, as a concoction, as a fabrication. It was not removed by Muslims or non-Christian scholars, but it was removed by 32 Christian scholars of the highest eminence, packed by 50 different corporate denomination as an interpolation, as a concoction, as a fabrication, because it was not there in the original manuscript. We Muslims, we should thank the galaxies of deities, the doctors of divinity, for getting the Bible one step closer to the Quran, closer to Islam. As the Quran says, 
ولا تقولو سلاسا don't say trinity in fact if you analyze as i said in my talk jesus christ peace be upon him never spoke about trinity that father son and holy ghost they were one in fact he said in the gospel of john chapter 14 verse number 28 my father is greater than i gospel of john chapter number 10 verse number 29 my father is greater than all gospel of matthew chapter number 12 verse number 28 i cast out devil with the spirit of god gospel of luke chapter number 11 verse number 20 with the finger of god i cast out devil gospel of john chapter number 5 verse number 30 i can of my own self do nothing as i hear i judge and my judgment is just because i seek not my will but the will of thy father who has sent me He never spoke about Trinity. In fact, when he was asked that which is the first of the commandments, he said, "It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number twelve, verse number twenty-nine." Shama Israelo adnai lahaino adnai chad, which means, "Your O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord." But if you ask the Christian Church in the Catechism, they tell you that the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. but they aren't three persons they are one person 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 but not three person one person what language is this 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 3 it's not equal to 1 1 into 3 is 3 not 1 so when we ask them that suppose there are three triplets identical triplets if one of them commits murder can you hang the other they say no Then you ask them why? Because each one has a different personality. If one of the triplets commit murder, you can't hang the other because each one has a different personality. And when the Christian, when they think about the Father in heaven, they think like an old man, like Santa Claus, sitting in the heaven on one of the planets with the earth as his footstool. When they think about the Son, that Jesus Christ peace be upon him, they think of a tall man who is fair, who has got blonde eyes. like jeffrey hunter you see in the movie king of kings he did acting of jesus christ peace be upon him jeffrey hunter they have a certain mental picture when they talk about holy ghost they think of a dove as the bible says which came upon jesus christ peace be upon him when he was baptized or they think it like a spirit that came at the feast of pentecost which is mentioned in the bible but when you ask the christian that when you speak about trinity how many pictures do you have in your mind the christian will tell you one believe me he is lying to you because 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3 it is not one hope that answers the question assalam alaikum my name is mohammad javed and my question is why can god not take a human form brother asked a question that why can god not take a human form if god wants he can take a human form but the moment he takes a human form he ceases to be god because god and man they are two opposites man is mortal god is immortal you can't have a mortal and immortal person at the same time man has a beginning god has got no beginning you can't have a person who has a beginning and no beginning at the same time man has an end god has no end so you can't have a person having an end and no end at the same time it doesn't make sense so you can't have a god man you can either have god or you can have man you can't have a god man so if god takes human form he ceases to be god he becomes human being because man requires to eat god does not require to eat the quran says in surah anam chapter 6 verse number 14 that he feedeth everyone but doesn't require to be fed the human beings they require rest they require sleep the quran says in ayat al-kursi chapter number 2 verse number 255 which was also recited by the qari brother shaf mamudi allahu la ilaha illa hayyul qayyum la ta'khudhu sunnatan wa la nawm law ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard allah He is one and only, the self-existing. 
the eternal. No slumber can seize him, nor does he require sleep. To him belongs everything in the heaven and the earth. Therefore, God, when he takes the human form, he ceases to be God. You can't have a God-man together. And if a God becomes human being and gives up his quality and becomes man, why should you worship a human being? Because he has same power than you and me. People will want to worship you and me also then. What is the use of worshipping a person who has same powers like you and me? And later on if someone tells me this same human being became God, it's not possible. If human beings can become God, even you and I would become God tomorrow. Therefore, if Allah wants, He can become a human being. But He will cease to be a God. Therefore, Allah will never want to become a human being. Allah can tell a lie if He wants. But He will never tell a lie. Because to lie is ungodly. The moment he lies, he ceases to be God. Allah can do injustice if he wants. But he will not. Because to do injustice is ungodly. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 40, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. So if he does injustice, he ceases to be God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants, he can make a mistake. But he will not make a mistake because to make mistake is ungodly. So Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 52, that Allah does not make mistake. Allah doesn't err. So if he makes a mistake, he ceases to be God. Allah can forget if he wants. But he will not forget because forgetting is an ungodly act. So Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 52, Allah doesn't make a mistake, neither does he forget. The moment he forgets, he ceases to be God. Therefore, the Holy Quran says, In Allah ala kulli shayin kadir. Verily, Allah has power over all things. In several places. In Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 106. In Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 109. Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 284. Surah Al Imran chapter number 3, verse 29. Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 77 in Surah Fatir chapter 35 verse number 1 Allah says in Allah ala kulli shayin kadir for verily Allah has power over all things but Allah only does godly things he doesn't do ungodly things because Quran says in Surah Buraj chapter 85 verse number 16 Allah is the doer of all he intends whatever Allah intends he can do but he only intends godly things this theory of God becoming a human form is called as anthropomorphism. Almighty, God taking a human form. And most of the major religions, sometime or the other, they have in their philosophy that God has taken a human form. Some religion once, some several times. And they have a very beautiful logic for that. They say that God Almighty, He is so pure, He is so holy, he doesn't know regarding the feelings of the human beings, regarding the shortcomings, the difficulties a human being can have. He's so holy and pure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know how does a human being feel when he's hurt. How does he feel when he gets into trouble? So therefore, God Almighty came in the form of a human being in this world to set the rules for the human being. On the face of it, very good logic. But I tell these people, that if I manufacture a tape recorder, do I have to become a tape recorder to know what is good or what is bad for the tape recorder? No. I just write an instruction manual that when you want to play the audio cassette, put in the cassette, press the play button. When you want to stop, press the stop button. When you want to fast forward, press the FF button. Don't drop it from a height. It will get spoiled. Don't immerse it in water. It will get damaged. I write an instruction manual. I don't have to become a tape recorder to know what is good or what is bad for the tape recorder. Similarly, when Almighty God is our creator, he doesn't have to become a human being to know what is good or what is bad for the human being. He sends an instruction manual. And the last and final instruction manual for the human beings is the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran is the last and final instruction manual for the human beings the do's and don'ts for the human beings. And he need not come down in this world as a human being to give us the instruction manual. 
What does he do? He chooses a man amongst men to deliver his message. Whom we call as messengers or prophets. Who he communicates on a higher level through the revelation. It is so clear cut to any logical person that God Almighty cannot take human form. But any fool can also understand. That is the reason the Holy Quran says in Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse number 18. Summum bukmun um yun formula yun. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will not come to the true path. And the Bible gives the same message. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 13, verse number 13, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Rig Veda also gives the same message. In book number 10, chapter number 71, verse number 4, that though they see the word, they see it not. Though they hear the word, they hear not. Assalamu alaikum. If all the major religions and scriptures speak about one God, then does it imply that all these religious scriptures, that is Bible, Vedas, etc., are the word of God? And does it further imply that whichever religion you follow, be it Islam or Hinduism or Christianity, it is one, the same? Sister has a question that I have quoted so many various scriptures and proved about the concept of Almighty God, that is monotheism. Does it imply that all these religious scriptures I quoted, they are the word of Almighty God? And does it imply that irrespective whether you follow Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, it's one and the same? Sister, many people have the misconception that Islam came into existence and the founder of the religion of Islam was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 14 years ago. In fact, Islam is there in existence since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 24, ummatin illa khalafiha nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner. The Holy Quran says in Surah Ra, chapter number 13, verse number 7, وَلِقُلْنِ قَوْمٍ had. And to every nation have we sent a guide. By name, only 25 are mentioned in the Holy Quran. But our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, there were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. By name, we know only 25 mentioned the Holy Quran. Adam, Moses, Jesus, Solomon, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But there were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. Similarly, by name, we know only four revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Furqan. Torah is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Furqan, that's the Holy Quran, is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But if you analyze that all the other scriptures, whether are they the word of God or not? Bible, can I say it's the word of God or not? We believe in the Injil, the Wahi which was given to Isa alayhi salam. This Bible that the Christians have today, it's not the Wahi which we believe in. This Bible does contain the word of God. It also contains the word of prophet and also words of historian as well as pornography. It's totally not the word of God. No wonder the Christian scholars, they're keeping on revising the Bible. We believe in the original Wahi given to Isa alayhi salam, but the present Bible is not the correct Wahi. It may contain part of the Wahi. How to check up which part is true? You have to check it with the Furqan. And the Furqan is the Holy Quran. Similarly, if you analyze all the messengers that were sent before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, all the revelations that came before Holy Quran, all of these revelations and these messengers were only sent for their people. And the message was supposed to be followed only for a particular limited time period. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 49, that Isa, 
He was sent only for the Bani Israel. The message is repeated in Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 6, that Isa alayhi salam, the son of Mary, was sent only for the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. The same message is given in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tells his disciples that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims. Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That means he was only sent for the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, that I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So all the messengers and all the revelation, by name only four revelations are given in the Holy Quran. But there were several revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Sufa, Ibrahim, and various other revelations. But all the revelations that came before the Holy Quran, and all the messengers that came before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for their people and for a particular time period. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Holy Quran says, in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 107, it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to the whole of humankind, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures. The Holy Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter 34, verse number 28, that, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَزِيرًا that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the humankind yet do not know. Similarly, all the religious scriptures that were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that came before the Quran were only meant for that people and for a particular time period. But the Holy Quran, it says in Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse 52, as well as Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 185, and Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 41, that it was sent for the whole of humanity. Regarding a question, that are these scriptures, the Vedas, the Bible, the Zed Avesta, the Satir, the Upanishad, are they the word of Almighty God? What I can say, that we believe in Injil as the word of God, but the present Bible is not the word of God. Regarding Veda, Upanishad, Gita, Zedavesta, Dasati, I can say maybe they were the word of God. Maybe. I cannot say for sure. Since the Quran does not say that Veda is the word of God, I cannot say for sure. I can only say maybe they were the word of God. But even if they were the word of God, all the scriptures beside the Holy Quran have been changed by human beings. They have been corrupted. As a famous critic of Islam, William Muir, he said two centuries before that the only religious scriptures which has maintained its purity is the Holy Quran for 12 centuries. William Muir, who is a very strong critic of Islam, he had to agree that this Quran has maintained its original purity for 12 centuries. He said this 200 years before. So, regarding the messengers, whether Ram, whether Lakshman, all these, were they messengers of God or not? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was, because the Quran says. But the name of Ram and Buddha and Zoroaster is not mentioned in the Quran. So what I can say, maybe they were, I don't know. But even if they were, they were only meant for that time. And they were only supposed to be followed by that particular people. The scriptures that came before the Quran, they were only meant for a particular group of people and they were only meant to be followed till that time. So even if they were words of God, even if the previous messengers were messengers of God, you only have to follow the last and final messenger, that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even if the other scriptures were the word of God, today you have to follow the last and final message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the Holy Quran and nothing else. Regarding, can you be a Christian, Hindu, Muslim, it's the same? No, sister. It's not the same. Why? Because if you analyze, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 52, that Jesus, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. Same thing as the Bible says in Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse number 30. I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. 
if you translate into Arabic, not my will, God's will, it is nothing but Islam. He was a Muslim. Abraham, peace be upon him, the Holy Quran says, in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 67, he was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. So today, if you have to choose any religion, the Holy Quran says in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in the Dina in the Allah Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. Though the other religions speak about monotheism, only monotheism is not sufficient. You have to believe in Tawheed. You have to the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the Holy Quran repeats the message in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 85, that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, submitting the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will not be accepted of him. And in the hereafter, he'll be among the losers. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Azam Khan, and a mechanical engineer by profession. First, I congratulate you for the beautiful speech you have delivered. Now, my question is, water is called by different names in different languages, like in English as water, in Hindi as Pani, in Tamil as Tani. Similarly, if God is either called Ram or Jesus, is it not one and the same? So that was the question, that water in different languages can be called as water in English, Pani in Hindi, Tani in Tamil. Similarly, God is one. Can we not call him by Ram or Jesus, etc.? Peace be upon him. As I mentioned in my talk, the Holy Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 110, Holidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayyama Tadu, Fala al Asma al Husna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name and it should not conjure up a mental picture. It should contain the qualities of Almighty God. And the same message is repeated in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 8. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 180. As well as in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 24, which says, to Allah belongs the most beautiful name. You can call him by any name, but it should not conjure up a mental picture. Regarding a question that water is called by different names in different languages, and I know about it. In English, it's called as water. In Hindi, as Pani. In Tamil, as Tani. In Arabic, it's called as Mai. In Surah al chapter 21, verse number 30. In Sanskrit, it's called as Apa. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 4. In Shuddha Hindi, it's called as Jal. In Gujarati, as Jal or Pani. In Marathi, as Pani. It's called as in Kannad. It's called as Nir. In Telugu, Nir. And in Malayalam as Vellam. Various languages. You can call. <laughs> I gave you only 10 examples. Quran gives 99 attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's no objection if you call water in any language as long as it is water. In any language. But it should be water. It should not be something else. For example, if suppose someone comes and tells me that I have been advised by my friend that every day in the morning I should have one glass of pani. I know pani means water, so I understand what he's saying. But then he continues, but when I have that one glass of pani, I feel like vomiting. I ask him, why do you feel like vomiting? So he tells me, because the water stinks. It is yellowish in color. Later, I realized that what he's talking is not pani, it is urine. <laughs> so somebody told him that you have one glass of urine, but the name he gave was pani. So you can call water by pani, tani, mani, apa, pani, no problem. But it should be water. You can call water by any name. But anything else besides water, neither can you call it water, neither can you call it pani, neither can you call it tani, neither can you call it as mani. Water as water you can call, but something else as water you can't call. People may think that what? An illogical example. Even an ignorant person can make out the difference between urine and water. Only a fool will not know the difference between urine and water. And I agree with them. That even an ignorant person knows the difference between urine and water. Similarly, 
those people who know the concept of Almighty God, the correct concept, they say that these people who worship false God, they are not only ignorant, they are foolish. Can't they differentiate between a true God and a false God? You give it any name. But if it's a true God, you can give it the name of God. If it's not a true God, you're giving false God the name of God. Aren't they foolish? They are foolish. For example, if you want to buy some gold, there's a person who comes and wants to sell his gold jewelry to you. And he says, this is 24 karat sona. You know that sona in Hindi means gold. In Arabic, it is Zahaba. You know it very well. But even after knowing that sona in Hindi is for gold, yet you will not just buy it like that. You will verify whether the sona, what is calling 24 karat sona, is it actually 24 karat gold or not. You will not just buy it off. What will you do? You will go to a goldsmith and verify whether it is actually 24 karat sona or not. And after verifying with the touchstone, you know I give the example of touchstone in my talk, he tells you, it is fake. Though the jewelry was glittering, but all that glitter is not gold. You will verify before buying the sona, whether it's actually sona or not. Why? Because you have to pay money for it. You know, you don't want to lose. Because you know, if you lose a thousand rupees or 10,000 rupees, it's precious. So why don't you do the same when anyone says this is God? You check it up with the touchstone. Which is the touchstone? Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul hu Allahu ahad, say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam milid walam yulad, he begets not nor is begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufan ahad, there is nothing like him. So anyone says this is God, you first check it up with the touchstone whether actually is God or not. If he fits in that definition, we have got no objection accepting that person who they are calling as Almighty God. For example, suppose some lunatic, he says that Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is Almighty God, a lunatic, if he says that. We know we Muslims, we love our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We love him. We will do anything for him. We obey him. Even the non-Muslims. Michael H. Hart, when he wrote a book on 100 most influential people in the world, number one he gave to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yet, yet, in spite of that, you will use the touchstone, Surah Ikhlas. Though we respect a maximum amongst all the human beings, yet, we'll check with the touchstone, Surah Ikhlas. Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say is Allah one and only. Say is Muhammad one and only. May peace be upon him. Allah has sent several messengers. He's not the only messenger. We agree he's the last and final. But Quran says, you have to believe in all the messengers. Do not differentiate in the belief of the messengers. Second is Allah Hussamad, Allah the absolute and eternal. We know that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was a great human being, but he was not absolute and eternal. He toiled, he worked hard. His biography tells us that he was even stoned many times. He prayed to Almighty God. He was not absolute and eternal. Third test is Lam bin Walam Yulad. He begets not nor is begotten. We know that he was born in Mecca. He had a father and mother by the name of Abdullah and Amina. He had parents. He had children also. Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her. Ibrahim, may Allah be pleased with him. He had. He was begotten and he also begat. So he is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sure. Though we Muslim, we love our Prophet. We respect our Prophet. No Muslim in his true senses will ever say that Prophet Muhammad is Almighty God. Never. You know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has seen to it that the Islamic creed, the Shahada, says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. We say this five times a day minimum. In the Adhan, in the Aqama, before Salah, we always say, There is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. He is the servant of Allah. To see to it, that no one, however much he may love, he may not equate him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whoever you are saying is Almighty God, you use the touchstone. 
whether it be Jesus, whether it be Ram, whether it be Krishna, whether it be Buddha, whether it be Mahavir, use the touchstone. I have given you the touchstone. On the day of judgment, I can give shahada to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the thousands of people that were present here, I showed them how to use the touchstone. Now the God that you worship, <laughs> the God that you worship, you apply this formula of touchstone to that God. If it passes the touchstone, even I agree he is almighty God. If it doesn't pass, then you cannot call him God at all. Hope that answers the question. My name is M.D. Marathe. I am a technologist. Before I start, I would just like to explain that I would like to take the audience from the sentimental plane to a more scientific and rational plane. I hope I have your permission to. Today's school books present the following information. In the course of evolution, the animal man or Homo erectus evolved 2 million years ago with a brain size of 1000 cc against a size of 400 cc of the apes. Evolution continued with the brain growing to 1400 cc 200,000 years ago. And this animal was known as Homo sapien. The present form of man was evolved about 35,000 years ago and is known as Homo sapien sapien. Anthropologists have estimated that man developed a speech center in his brain 50,000 years ago. Now the question is, in this record of development, when did God originate and for what purpose? Number two, the progress of science has made it possible uh, to... Only one question, sir. You, any no, no, question you can This is in relation to that. If you cut it short... No, no, it's, or it's, 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 the answer will not be long. Give me the time for the questions, please. Yeah, yeah, okay. The progress God of science has made it possible to clone all animals, including man, to produce any number of animals having all desired characteristics. If God ever existed, how much of the power attributed to God is now left with him? Third one, if God is described as a sea of kindness, finished, and mercy. Yet all leaders of all religions, when faced with the prospect of death, rush to a hospital like the one next door and never to the place of worship where they preached all their life that man lives and dies by the wish of God. Is there an explanation for this phenomenon? The brother has asked basically three questions. First, he gave according to him, the theory of evolution of man and said, where does God fit in? Secondly, after as God has created all this thing, how much of his power has been reduced? Thirdly, that when you get sick, you run to the hospital, not to the temple or church or masjid. Three part of the question. He said the answer will be short. The question was long. So imagine, to give a detailed answer will take time. Brother, I'd like to tell you that what you quoted about the hemosapiens, etc., you are talking about the theory of evolution, brother. Theory of evolution. I'm a medical doctor. I have not come across a single book in my life which says fact of evolution. It is theory of evolution. And even I know about the theory of evolution and about the Darwin's theory. Complete answer referred to my video cassette, Quran and Modern Science Conflict of Conciliation. What Darwin said was only a theory. He wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in 1881 that I believe in this theory of natural selection because I don't have any proof. Only because it helps me in natural selection, it helps me in embryology, in classification, in rudimentary organs. There's no book saying the fact of evolution. All the books say theory of evolution. That's why if we have to say to a friend that if you are present at Darwin's time, Darwin's theory would have been proved right trying to insinuate to look like an ape. There were missing links. Darwin himself said the missing links. You spoke about the hormonoids, you only spoke about one wave. I'll tell you about all the four waves. The first wave was Lucy. Lucy. Lucy was first wave which came three and a half million years. You talk about two million years, I'm telling you what scientists have said three million years ago. Lucy. It died out by the ice age. The second came the Homo erectus. Homo erectus about 500,000 years. After that came the Neanderthal man, the third wave, about 40,000 years ago. And the last was the Cro-Magnon. But brother, there's no link between all these stages. It's only a hypothesis. According to P.P. Grasset, according to P.P. Grasset, who held the chair of evolutionary studies in Paris, in Shoujon University, in 1971 he said, it is letting our imagination run too wild, just based on vestiges to say who our ancestors were. I do know there are some people who speak about Darwin's theory. 
I'm a medical doctor, I know about that. But do you know, there are hundreds of scientists who speak against it. <laughs> Few scientists speak in favor, but there are more who speak against it. For the complete answer, refer to my video called the Quran Modern Science. There are few scientists because there's no fact of evolution. They say, let's support a theory. Quran doesn't support any theory or hypothesis. Quran speaks about fact. <laughs> so regarding your two million years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no beginning. When man came, no one knows the exact date. No one knows. Assumption, assumption. Assumption is there. But Quran says the first man was Adam alayhi salam. First man. And with it came Eve. May Allah be pleased with her. Man hasn't reached that stage. There's not a single statement in the Holy Quran which science has proved wrong yet. Hypothesis go against the Quran. Theories go against the Quran. There's not a single scientific fact which is mentioned in the Holy Quran which goes against established science. It may go against theory. So brother, your thing is only supported by few people not by the majority. Regarding second part of the question, that if Allah has created all these things, how less his power has become? You can't understand it completely. As the Quran says in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 103, is beyond comprehension. I can give you a simile, not exactly same, an ocean. If you take a drop out of the ocean, how much does the level of the ocean go down? How much? How much? Oh. Yet, yet, in spite of this, the difference between Allah becoming less when he creates things and the difference between the level of the ocean becoming less is infinite. The level of the ocean may become 0.000000 000 000 000 000 000 somewhere, 0 .00 somewhere it will end. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not even, and not even a bit becomes less. He is all powerful. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If such a God who becomes less, we don't worship such God who becomes less, he keeps on creating, he will sometimes lose his power. So this God is eternal, absolute. As I said in my talk, he is absolute and eternal. Everything depends on him. He doesn't depend on anything. Where did Allah come? Allah was before the universe created. Where does he fit in? Where did he get created? He is uncreated. You ask me the question, where did he come into existence? He is uncreated. It's like you asking me that when I tell that my friend, he told me that my brother Tom, he gave birth to a child. Is the child girl or a boy? I, being a doctor, know very well a man cannot give birth to a child. So where does the question come, whether it's girl or a boy? So you're asking me, when did Allah come fit in the picture? Allah is uncreated. Because he's uncreated, the question doesn't arise, when did he come? He's there. Question doesn't arise. Regarding a third part of the question, that when people get sick, they run to the hospital. They don't run to the temple. They don't run to the mosque, not to the church. The brother may not be knowing all the people. I'm a doctor, I know. That when the doctors give up, the thing we doctors say, We doctors say, who is Shafi? It is he who cures. That doesn't mean a person gets sick, only go to the temple. Because the Quran says in Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43, as well as in Surah Furqan chapter 25 verse 59, if you are in doubt, go to a person who knows, who is an expert. If you get sick, besides praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go to a person who is an expert in medicine. Go to a doctor. Quran says that. But even after going to the doctor, have faith in Allah. Because he is the person who cures you, he can cure you with a doctor or without a doctor. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we don't believe in blind belief. No Muslim scholar will ever say, if you are sick, don't go to a doctor. Go to a doctor, but finally, who cures is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why all the doctors, when all their brain, all their science, all the medicine fails, they say, it is only Allah who can save you. Assalamu alaikum brother, I am Dr. Kamar Ara and my question is, Christians explain the concept of Trinity 
as well as that God can take human form by giving the example that water can be present in three states, as solid like ice, liquid as water, and gas as vapor. Yet it is one and the same water. Similarly, a person can also be a father, a brother, a businessman at the same time, but yet he's the one and the same person. So why not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? So sister has a question. Regarding Trinity, if the Christians have the concept of Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The previous question was, I proved it, that from the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, never believed in Trinity. Now she gave an example. She's giving a human logic, asking a question, that if water can be present in three states, as solid, liquid, and gas, as ice, water, and vapor, when water can be in three states, why can't God be? Similarly, the Christian missionaries they pose the question, even God Almighty can be present in three forms, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, if you analyze, I do agree matter can be in three states, solid, liquid, and gas. But you should realize that if water is present in three states, solid, liquid, gas, as ice, water, and vapor, in all the three states, the constituent, the component of water is the same, H2O. Even if it's ice, the constituent and component is H2O. Even when it is water, it is H2O. Even when it is vapor, it is H2O. Even when it's ice, even when it is gas or liquid, it is H2O. That's very important. Now let's analyze the example they gave of Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In three forms, if you say, for sake of argument, I agree. But are the constituent of all these three things, Father, Son, that is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and Holy Ghost the same? We know very well that human beings have got flesh and bone. A spirit and God Almighty has got no flesh and bone. Human beings require to eat. God Almighty does not require to eat. And the same message Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, gave. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 39 to 43, that, Behold my hands and feet. It's I myself. Handle me and see. That a spirit has got no flesh and bone, as you see me have. And he gave his hands and feet. And they were overjoyed. To prove what? That he was not a spirit. He was not God Almighty. And the verse continues. Do you have meat to eat? And the next verse says that he ate broiled fish and honeycomb. To prove what? That he was God? To prove that he was not God. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, a spirit has no flesh and bone as I have. Proving that he was not a spirit, he was not Almighty God. Regarding the second example, just to give the example, that a person can be a father, a brother, and a businessman at the same time. So why can't God be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? It's a very good example. And I do agree that one person can be a father, can be a brother, and can be a businessman at the same time. Many people out here also may be father, brother, and businessman at the same time. But if suppose the sister of that man tells a secret to the brother, but natural, even the father and businessman will know that secret. Because one and the same person. If a sister tells a secret to the brother, who is a father and a businessman at the same time, when the secret is told to the brother, even the father part of that man and businessman part of that man will know that secret. But when you read in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 13, verse number 32, it says, Of that day, of that hour, knoweth no man, no, not even the angels in the heaven, nor the son of man, but the father. The knowledge of the hour of that day, no one knows Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, except the Father. Not even the angels, not even himself. If Father, that's God Almighty, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, one and the same, and if knowledge of hour is known to God Almighty, even Jesus should know about it, peace be upon him. So this proves that they were not one. <laughs> further, further, if the brother dies, even the man and the businessman will die. If the brother dies, even man and businessman will die. So when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Bible, according to the Christian, he died on the cross. Do you mean to say even God Almighty and the Holy Ghost died? <laughs> so
Assalamu alaikum. I am Riyaz Vadkaunkar and a businessman. So my question is, Allah is the most appropriate name for God. So besides Quran, is it mentioned in any other religious scriptures? To pose the question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained my talk, is an appropriate name for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. Is this name Allah mentioned anywhere else in the other religious scriptures? If you analyze, most of the religious scriptures which have the concept of Almighty God, somewhere or the other, most probably, one of the attributes of God Almighty is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if you read the Bible, in the Hebrew language, they call God Almighty as Elohim. Him is a sign of respect in the Semitic languages. So actually it is Elo, Elo for God. And if you read the Bible, Old Testament also, it says for God, Elo or Ella. And in the English Bible, revised by Reverend Scofield, he gives the spelling of Ella as alternatively either as E-L or E-L-A-H or A-L-A-H. He pronounced as Ella. El, Ella or Ella. A-L-A-H. We Muslim, when we write in English Allah, we write A-L-L-A-H. But Reverend Scofield wrote A-L-A-H. They pronounce Ella, we pronounce Allah. When I was in school, I was taught Tio Tu, Dio Du, Gio, Gio is what? Not go, it is go. I was taught beauty but, beauty cut, NUT nut, beauty, not but, but. I said, what sort of a language is this? He said, no, you have to say beauty but, not but. And if I have to pass the examination, even I say beauty, but. Geo is not go, it is go. I have to, because it's their language. Similarly, we know how to pronounce correctly Allah. They say Allah, he said no problem. The right pronunciation is Allah. Later on, when Reverend Scofield realized what he had done, that he's coming closer to the Quran, maybe people took objection. In the revised edition, that thing is taken out. A-L-A-H is taken out. So now when you get the Scofield English Bible, only E-L and E-L-A-H is there. A-L-A-H is not there. But in spite of that, yet, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in every Bible, yet, the name of Allah is there. Because, according to the Bible, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, allegedly he was crucified, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46, as well as in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, Verse number 34, when he was put on the cross, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. So as to say, Oh God, oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you analyze and ask them, that what is Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? It's a Hebrew quotation. But it has been maintained. Even in the English Bible, it has been maintained. And then they translate, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Oh God, oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some people say the name of God is Jehovah. So I ask them, does Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani sound like Joha, Joha, why has thou forsaken me? They say no. Does it sound like Jesus, Jesus, peace be upon him, why has thou forsaken me? They say no. Hebrew and Arabic language are sister languages. If you translate Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani into Arabic, it is Allah, Allah, Lama Taraktani. Does it sound similar? Yes. Why? Sister language. And the best part of it is that the Bible has been translated into more than 2,000 different languages. And in every language, this quotation is verbatim the same. Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani. Whether it's a Tamil Bible, Chinese Bible, Hebrew Bible, any Bible, this Hebrew quotation has been maintained and the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there in each and every translation of the Bible. This word Allah, like Guru Nanak, one of the attributes he gave to God is Rahim. Also, he gave Allah. If you read the Hindu scriptures, Upanishads, one of the Upanishads is called as the Allah Upanishad. And God Almighty has called by Allah several times. Even in Rig Ved, even if you read the Rig Ved, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the attributes, is given in book number two, hymn number one, verse number 11. The name, one of the attributes of God Almighty is Allah. They write it as I-L-A. But when you pronounce it, 
we have to tell them, pronounce it as Allah. Hope they answer the question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Haji Muhammad. Brother Zakir, Brother Zakir, you mentioned in your talk that Jesus never claimed divinity. But it is mentioned in the Bible that Jesus said, I and my father are one. Does this not imply that he claimed divinity? Well, that was a question that I said in my talk. That nowhere does the Bible say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, claimed divinity. And he gave a quotation of the Bible that Jesus said, I and my father are one. What the brother is quoting is a verse from the Bible in the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 30, which does say, I and my father are one. But when you ask the Christian missionaries that what is the context? I have not yet met a Christian missionary who can tell you the context without opening the Bible. He knows I and my father are one, but he doesn't know the context. For example, if I quote to someone that the Quran says, do not pray, most of the Muslims will be shocked. What is I am talking? And if you open it, does say do not pray, but it's half the verse. Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 43 says, do not pray with your mind before. Do not pray when you are intoxicated. So if I only quote, do not pray, it will mean Quran says don't pray. Have the quotation. So for context, I and my father are one. You have to go to Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 23, and I'm quoting from my memory, that Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch, verse number 24. It says, and the Jews came around him and asked him, how long does thou make us doubt? If thou art the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse number 25 says, I told you, but you believe me not. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. Verse number 26 says, that you believe not, because you are not my sheep, as I said unto you. The Jews, they were asking Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that why don't you speak plainly? So he tells them that, yes, I am the Messiah. I have told you clearly, but because you are not my sheep, you don't believe in me. Verse number 27 continues. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, continues saying that my sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, that I give them eternal life. No man can pluck them out of my hand, and they shall not perish. Verse number 29 says, my father who give it to me, he is greater than all. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Then verse number 30 says, I and my father are one. Any person who has little bit sense can make out, I and my father are one, doesn't mean one as one person. It means one in purpose. Verse number 28 says, no man can pluck them out of my hand. Jesus Christ, peace be upon his saying, no man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse 29 is saying, no man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse number 30 says, I and my father are one. In purpose. Both Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and Almighty God, they are one in purpose. If I say that my father is a doctor, and he is a doctor, alhamdulillah, even I am a doctor. If I say, I and my father are one, what does it mean? It means one in purpose. As medical profession, my father is a doctor, even I am a doctor. It doesn't mean that I and my father are one. It means my father is a medical doctor, even I am a medical doctor. But Christians say, no, no, it means one, actual unity. So we say, okay, you say actual unity, let's read further. If you go ahead in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 21, it says that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that he, all of them are one. My father in me and I in thee, we all are one. Does it mean that God Almighty is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is in all his 12 disciples? So there will be 14 gods. Jesus Christ, God Almighty and 12 disciples. The same one is used there and here. If you go to the source, the same word is used. If you go to the Greek, same word is used. So does it mean you have 14 gods? And among those disciples, Judas was a traitor. Even his God, Thomas doubted Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Is he God? Peter, Jesus Christ says, he is satanic. Is he also God? No. All of them, God Almighty, Jesus Christ and the Apostle are one in purpose. They are same. Again, if you go two verses ahead, Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 23 says that I am in thee and you are in me. He tells the disciple. Does it make all of them God? No. It means one in purpose. 
But then Krishna will say, okay, I've quoted the first part. Why don't you quote after that? After verse number 30, Gospel of John chapter 10. Let's go ahead. Gospel of John chapter number 10, verse number 31 says, And Jews picked up stones again to stone at Jesus' peace be upon him. Verse number 32 says, And Jesus' peace be upon him asked them, For which of the good works of my father do you stone me? Verse 33 says that we don't stone you for any good work. But because you blaspheme, being a man, call yourself God, that's why we stone you. What about him? I'm reading from my memory. Any person wants to check up, can check up. It's there in the Bible. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 23 onwards, I'm quoting. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, gives the answer. The Jews say that, see, he is trying to blaspheme, calling himself God. Good riddance, they want to kill him. Good riddance. The so Christians say, oh, the Jews called him God Almighty. See, they understood him correctly for redemption. One wants for redemption, they're calling him God. The other group of people for good riddance. But the answer is given in the next verse. Verse number 34 of the Gospel of John chapter 10 says that, Is it not mentioned in your scriptures that ye are gods? And if the person to whom the word of God came, if he says God, the scripture is not broken. If you check up in the Bible, in the Psalm chapter number 82, verse number 6 does say that ye are gods. So Jesus Christ gave the answer that the person to whom the word of God came, if you call him God, it is not blaspheme. It is meaning that they are one in purpose. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. This is uh, Yasin. I am a software engineer by profession. My question is the Hindu pundits and scholars agree that the Vedas and other Hindu religious scriptures prohibit idol worship. But initially, because the mind may not be matured, therefore an idol is required for concentration while worshipping. After the mind reaches higher consciousness, the idol is not required for concentration. What do we have to say about this? The brother has a question. The Hindu pundits and scholars, they agree that the Vedas is against idol worship, against making image of Almighty God. But they give the logic that initially because the mind is not matured, you require idol to concentrate. Later on when you reach higher consciousness, idol is not required. If this is the logic, I would like to say that we Muslims have already reached the higher consciousness. You don't require. You don't require any idols to concentrate on Almighty God. We have already reached the higher consciousness, if this is the logic. But now let's analyze. Once I was having a discussion with a Swami from the ISKCON, Hare Ram Hare Krishna, you know, it's there in Bombay. Hare Ram Hare Krishna. He came to IRF and we were having a discussion on idol worship. So he gave me the example. That brother Zakir, see, when your son asks you, why does it thunder? So you tell him that, I ma chakki pistiye. I ma chakki pistiye. That is the grandmother in heaven, she is grinding flour. Why? Because the child is innocent, can't understand. Therefore we give this. Similarly, human beings, because they are immature, initially idol is allowed. Later on when they get matured, idol is not allowed. So I tell them, and I told this Swami from his con, Hare Ram Hare Krishna, that I will never tell my child when he asks me why does it thunder that I ma chakki pistiye. Grandmother is grinding flower. You know why? Because to tell a lie is haram. It's wrong to tell a lie in Islam. You cannot tell, even if it's a white lie, you can't say. In extreme cases, certain cases, someone puts a gun and you lie, that's the different thing. Otherwise, normal circumstances, why should a person lie? Because if I tell my son that I ma chakki pisti hai, Grandmother is grinding flour in heaven. When he goes to school and when the teacher teaches him that the thundering after lightning is due to expansion of rapidly heated air, he will think the teacher is lying. And afterwards, when he comes to know the fact, he will say, my father was a liar. <laughs> so this is the problem, that why should you say such wrong things? And this philosophy is common amongst all the human beings. Common. Most of them, if not all. And you know, we have like those people who stay in a building. Like when they play with the children, you know, they throw the toy out. Crow has taken it, you know. You do the action of throwing the toy out of the building. Then you find even your child is throwing out toys. <laughs> and then when you ask these parents, why is your child throwing out toys? Everyone does. Some children does. Some children pick the. The mother will tell, all the children throw out toys. So if my child throws, what is great? 
All the children don't throw. It is because most of the parents do this trick. Kawa leke gaya. So even he wants to do that trick. Even he throws it out. My son, Alhamdulillah, we are staying in nine story. Nine story in Masgon. My son has never thrown any toy. You know why? I have never played the trick with him. Kawa leke gaya. So you teach wrong things and your child remains following wrong things. Best is to give the answer. Simplify. Simplify and give the answer. To the best of the understanding, I know the child, many things don't understand. Give the answer in a simple way. But if you don't know the answer, you should have the guts to tell the truth, I don't know. But most of the children, especially nowadays, they won't take the simple answer. If I tell my son I don't know, he will tell me, Abba, why don't you know? <laughs> so what happens, then we have to do a homework. We have to go and find the answer. It educates us as well as our children. But never tell a lie. You can never let your child grow up on falsehood. There are other pundits, when I have discussions, they give me the example. Let's see Brother Zakir. We do know that Vedas are against idol worship and it's wrong to do idol worship. But initially in standard one, because the mind is not matured, idol worship is fine. But when they graduate, then idol worship is not required. So I tell them that if a person goes to school in standard one, the fundamentals, the basics of any subject should be strong. If the basics and fundamentals are strong, in future, even the structure will be strong. If the basics are not strong, the structure will not be strong. So if a teacher teaches in standard one, in mathematics, two plus two is equal to four. Even after he goes to standard three, four, five, when he passes school, when he becomes a graduate, even if he does PhD in mathematics yet, two plus two will always remain four. He may learn trigonometry, algebra, logarithms, but the basics of arithmetic addition, two plus two, will remain the same. If the teacher teaches wrong things, two plus two is five, or two plus two is equal to six, in standard one, what will happen to the student when he graduates? Therefore, the basics should always be strong. The fundamentals should always be strong. And these scholars, they know very well the fundamentals of the Vedas are regarding concept of God, that God has got no image. You cannot make any idol of God. That's the fundamental. I ask these people that if you know that the followers of a religion are doing wrong things, it's your duty to correct them. If your son says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, will you keep quiet? In standard one, you say, no, no, let him graduate, then I'll tell him that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Will you say that? You'll correct him initially. You won't wait till he graduates. As much as you can explain, you explain. So if they know the Vedas are against idol worship, it's their job to tell the people that this is the fundamental of faith. Even in the initial stages, you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without an idol. Hope that answers the question. The question is, when all believe in one God, why people fight in the name of God and in the name of religion? The person asked the question that if all the people, all the human beings, or most of them, believe in one God, believe in one type of religion, why do they fight? Why is there so much of infighting, riots, etc.? No religion, which I know of, tell that people should fight with each other unnecessarily. No religion says that. Neither the Quran, neither the Veda, neither the Bible, unnecessarily should not. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any human being, unless it be for murder or creating mischief in the land, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. Quran does not say if you kill a Muslim, you have killed the whole of humanity. If you kill any human being, unless it be for murder or creating mischief in the land, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. So no religion teaches that people should fight with each other unnecessarily. Suppose people are trying to oppress you. Then most of the religion says that you should put that oppressor back in its place. Quran says that, Surah Anfa, Surah Tawbah, that if the people try to drive you out of your house, out of your faith, out of your land, then you can fight them for self-defense. Even the Gita, the whole Bhagavad Gita, it is known as the nectar of the Vedas. Lord Krishna, he is giving advice to Arjun. That see, you fight for the truth. Even if the opposite people are relatives, don't stop. If they are in the wrong, you fight. 
The Quran says in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 81, وَقُلْ جَا الْحَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلِ قَانَ ذَهُوكَ وَنَزْلُ مِنَ الْقُرَانَ مَا وَشِفَاءُ وَرَحْمَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا إِذُ الظَّالُمِ إِلَّا خَسَارَ That when truth is heard against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. The Quran is a healing and mercy for those who believe. It was revealed in stages. But for those who are unbelievers, it's nothing but loss after loss. So basically, no religion tells you to fight, unless in self-defense. Even the police kills the robber in self-defense, kills the criminal. But normally, under normal circumstances, people should not fight. But yet I do know that people fight. Why is the big question. You know what the reason? The reason is people fight for power, for material things. The politician, he wants vote. But what does he do? He instigates a riot. A riot. And then you get marginalized. And then Hindus vote Hindu, Muslim vote Muslim. Politicians. If a builder wants a land, you can't acquire the land because there are thousand huts there. What does he do? He instigates a riot on the base of religion. The huts are burned down and then he builds a big building on that land for money. So these people, for power, for money, for material requirements, these people, they instigate the riots. Otherwise, the common Hindu, the common Muslim, Alhamdulillah, we love each other. We love our non-Muslim brother. <laughs> Bombay, if you know Bombay, even during partition, there was not such a right as we had a couple of years ago. Engineered by whom? Politicians. Politicians engineered it. All because for power, for material desire. Otherwise, no religion says that you should fight with one another. We do know. We have similarities. We agree with that. We have differences also. But a politician, on the front of everyone, you say, Ram bhi khuda, Allah bhi khuda. Front of it. And behind you goes an engineer's rights. See, we don't believe in pseudo-secularism. If suppose two people are there, one person is saying 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, the other person is saying 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. That does not mean, oh, he's such a good man, 2 plus 2 is also equal to 4, 2 plus 2 is also equal to 5. Ah, I am a very Dejbhakt, secular person. What secular? Hypocrisy. I should have the guts to say, see, what you are saying 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 is right, what you are saying 2 plus 2 is 5 is wrong, but I will not fight with you. I will tell you the truth, I will not fight with you. Same the Quran says in Surah Kafirun, chapter 109, verse number 1 to 6. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْقَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَبِدُونَ مَا عَبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَبِدُمْ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَبِدُونَ مَا عَبُدْ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ Say to those who reject faith, I will not worship what you worship, nor will you worship what I worship. I will not be worshipping that which you want me to worship, nor will you worship what I worship. To you is your way, to me is mine. To you is your religion, to me is mine. I will present the truth to him. Why? Don't do idol worship. Don't have wrong concept of God. Yet if you have, lakum dinukum wal yadin. To you is your way, to me is mine. The Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 256, din. There is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. If you hold the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will take you from darkness to light. If you hold the hand of the evil one, the devil, He will take you from light to darkness. The choice is yours. But no religion says that you should fight with each other unnecessarily. Hope the answer My name is Sushil Karangutkar, official photographer, All India Radio, Vivid Bharati Service and Bombay Doordarshan Kendra. I have visited holy country of uh, Islam, that is Saudi Arabia, three times and spent nearly four years uh, in Saudi Arabia and watched Islam from closer distance. Now, Dr. Jakinak, my question is, there is a Muslim blind person. He is one eye is replaced by eye donated by a Hindu person. His kidney one kidney is replaced by kidney donated by a Christian person and his heart is replaced by a heart donated by a Parsi gentleman. Such a Muslim person will be allowed to perform prayers in the mosque. The brother asked the question that he had been to Saudi Arabia and one person his eyes from a Hindu or heart from a Christian and kidney from so and so, various things. So having eye from another religion, heart from another religion, can you offer salah in the mosque? The answer is, brother, according to Islam, 
Every human being is born as a Muslim. Every heart is a Muslim. Every kidney is a Muslim. Every eye is a Muslim. What is the meaning of Muslim? Muslim is the person who submits their will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every heart submits their will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm talking about the organic heart. Organic heart, no? Organic heart, it pumps blood. The heart of the Christian pumps blood. The heart of a Muslim pumps blood. The heart of a Hindu pumps blood. The heart is a Muslim. I'm talking about the organic heart. I, the organic I, is a Muslim. But you see wrong things. I'm sorry, I'm not telling you. You may see. The human being sees wrong thing. So human being is to blame, but the eye sees, the eye is following the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The kidney is doing its job. It's purifying. It's a Muslim. So with the heart taken from a person who's born in a Hindu family or Christian family, every heart is a Muslim, every eye is a Muslim, every kidney is a Muslim, he will be very well allowed to play in a mosque. But even if a non-Muslim wants to come to the mosque, he's most welcome. Our beloved Prophet, he has discussions about concept of God. Time didn't permit me the revelation of Surah Ikhlas, the touchstone. The touchstone of theology, which I gave to everyone, was revealed when? When he was having a discussion with the Christians in the mosque. And they asked him, who is Allah? What can you think? The Quran says you convert all the trees into pens, all the ocean into ink. What will he say, Rahman, Rahim? What answer can he give? The direct revelation came. Kul, tell them. Kul ho Allah ho ahad. Say is Allah one and only. Allah ho samad. Allah the absent and eternal. Lam milad valam yulad. He begets not noise, he begotten. Walam ya kul lahu kufanad. There's nothing like him. Next question from the slip is from uh, Swati S. Malik. She's an engineer. As you mentioned in your talk that Hindus say, sun, moon, snake, and monkey is God. Basically, it's not like that. We Hindus don't believe that the above mentioned things are God. But we believe that God is everywhere. God is in each and everything. God is in coat. God is in air, in fire. Does Islam believe the same? If not, then why? What's wrong in this? The question posed was that they believe that the moon the sun, the tree, they are God, but God is present everywhere. Since God is present everywhere, therefore, we worship it. What does Islam believe? See, the Holy Quran says that wherever you turn your face, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is everywhere. But what does it mean? Are you talking Allah is present physically? When Quran says Allah is everywhere, do you mean to say physical? My question is, what do you mean Allah is everywhere? Is it physical? If physical, if you believe Allah is physical, then you should be able to see it. No, I can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not physical. The knowledge of Allah is everywhere. The knowledge of Allah is everywhere. Allah has power over all things. But physically, He's not everywhere. Therefore, the Quran gives the logic. In Surah Shura, chapter 42, verse number 11, Laisa kamisli shay. There's nothing unto Him. Nothing like whatever unto Him. So I'm telling you, the moment you worship the sun, do you mean to say God is only there, nowhere else? So even if I agree with you, okay, you say God is everywhere, sake of argument, I agree with you. But then you're worshipping only a small part of God. The tree, very small in the full universe, speck. That means, indirectly, you're saying well, God is so small, only in the tree, only in the snake. So therefore, if you have to worship, worship the true God Almighty. Even though his knowledge is present everywhere, he is present everywhere, not in the physical form. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Brother Zakir Nayak. My question is regarding the form of Allah. Surah number 39, Zumar, verse 67. The translation says that, and on the day of resurrection, the whole of the earth will be grasped by his hand and the heavens will be rolled up in his right hand. There is also an hadith in support of this, Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 6, hadith number 336. Can we just imagine some form of Allah? This is a question in Surah Al-Zumur, it says, she's correct, Quran does say that, that in the day of judgment, resurrection, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold all the creation and various verses in the Quran, 
etc. But if you heard my talk, sister, I gave you the key word. The key, the key to this concept is for Ashura, chapter 42, verse number 11, which says, Laisa kamisli hi shay. There is nothing whatever like him. So if Quran says Allah has hands, people ask me that the Quran says Allah holds the sky. What do you mean holds like that? If I say I am holding my family together, do you mean to the 24 hours I am with my wife and my child? I'm not holding my wife and child always. Yet I'm holding them, but I'm not holding them like that. These are words used. And whenever, as I said, if Quran says Allah sees and hears, you owe oh, that my life here like us. He hears. How he hears? Allah Allah. Allah knows. He has a hand, but not like yours and mine. My fingers. With nail and with this. Not like that. He has a hand, yes, he has a hand. How he has a hand? There is nothing like him. How will he do it? Allah Allah. He will do it for sure. Quran says he'll hold it in the right hand, he will hold it in the right hand. How he'll hold it, I don't know. On the day of judgment, inshallah, you and I will witness that. The next question from the slip. Assalamu alaikum, brother Zakir. As Muslims, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nur. We cannot attribute any form or gender to him. Why then? When we speak of Almighty God, or as written in the Holy Quran, Allah is always referred to as He, a sister. The sister has asked a very good question, and this question had troubled me for several years. And she asked the question, Allah is Noor, He has got no gender, so why is it written as Hua, as He? And this question asked to various people, you know, in India and other scholars, but never got a satisfactory reply. Then I myself did a little research, and then I checked it up with the experts. But when I learned Arabic, the grammar, the Arabic grammar has got only two genders, male and female. English language, three gender, male, female, neuter. So if we translate hua into English, it can be translated as he or as it. Either he or it. Same as hia. If you translate into English, it can be translated as she or it. That's Arabic language, two genders, English language, Three genders. So who if you translate, you can translate he or it. He or as she or it. So who are, in English if you say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond any gender. So why have used he? Some people may say that if who are means he and it, and he are means she and it, both means it. So why did Allah use who are and not he are? Because Quran says, Say he is Allah and only. When I learned in grammar, in Arabic grammar, I was told that in the Arabic grammar, there are certain rules and criteria for feminine gender. Feminine gender. First, if it is feminine in nature, like mother, ummun, it becomes a feminine gender. Second rule, if it ends with the, the, it is feminine gender, like mirvahatun, fan. Ending with the, it becomes feminine gender. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a female, so it can't be feminine. It is not ending with the, is it ending with the? No, so it can't be feminine. Third is, it should end with bala alif, then it becomes feminine. Allah doesn't end with bala alif, so it can't become feminine. And another one is that pairs of the body, twos, like eyes, ainun, feminine, yadun, hands, feminine. Allah is kul huallahuad. Say the Allah one and only. It's not fair. So therefore, in defection, in default, since it can't be used as he or it, that she it, Allah uses who are it. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender at all. Assalamu alaikum, brother. My name is Ali Hussain. Now, in your talk, you have mentioned that, and even in your earlier talks, which I have heard, you have mentioned that Jesus in Bible is nowhere claiming divinity. Now, I had gone through a booklet which was propagating Christianity and implying that all the sufferings are uh, healed by Jesus, peace be upon him. And uh, it gave the reference that Jesus is saying, I am the Lord who heals you. And the reference was from Exodus chapter number 15, verse number 26. And even it went further saying that in 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Now, my emphasis on the first reference 
where he's saying that I am the Lord who heals you. Now, doesn't this imply or doesn't this indicate that Jesus is claiming divinity? Because they're quoting Exodus chapter number 15. Verse number 26. Verse 26 and saying, Jesus said that I healed you. Brother, Exodus is a part of the Old Testament. Old Testament. Jesus Christ never spoke in Exodus. Never. I said in my talk, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the whole Bible where Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says that he is God to worship me. This is the Bible I have got by the Christian, King James Version. Everything what Jesus Christ spoke is in red. You check it up, this will never be in red. It is not the words of Jesus, it is the word of somebody else. And even if I agree with you, for sake of argument, that Jesus did say, that he heals. And the Quran does agree with that. And I said in my talk, we believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. He healed those born and blind with God's permission. So I've got no objection in agreeing that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did heal the people. It's our faith, even we believe in it. But whatever he did, as the Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, he cast out devil by the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. With the finger of God, he cast out devil. He did everything which bore witness of the Father. So I've got no objection in agreeing that Jesus did do miracle. But regarding Exodus, it's not the word of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Even if it is, I've got no objection. Because whatever miracles he did, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that this is done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 24, verse number 24, for they shall arise many false Christ and false prophets. And if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Miracle is not the test. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 11, verse number 11, of those that are born of a woman, the greatest person is John the Baptist. Those that are born of a woman, the greatest person is John the Baptist. That means he was greater even than Jesus, peace be upon him. Because Jesus was born to Mother Mary. So amongst all born of a woman, the greatest is John the Baptist according to Jesus, peace be upon him. Which miracle did he do? Not a single. Therefore, miracle is not the criteria to make him God. Hope that answers the question. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this program possible. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I thank all our guests, including the press, for attending the program. We also appreciate and thank all the persons involved in the organizing and recording of this event. Jazakumullah khairan. <laughs> لا تسجدوا للشمس ولا للقمر واسجدوا لله الذي خلقهم إن 